week one, day one <laughs> of a new series. We just finished uh, a walk through the book of Colossians. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you can check those out on our YouTube channel. Um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed uh, the book of Colossians. That was uh, um, highly doctrinal. Uh, we're shifting now back to the book of Daniel. Uh, for those of you that have been with us for, for some time, uh, Pastor Sean was about five chapters deep into the book of Daniel uh, when, uh, when he left us to return back to San Diego. Uh, and so I had many members of the church say, hey, we really want to finish Daniel. Uh, but as I was looking at it more and more, I didn't feel good just jumping right into the middle of a book. Uh, so we're going to take it at a relatively quick clip through the first five chapters. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we're, we're going to work our way through this wonderful book. Uh, many people shy away from uh, apocalyptic literature. Revelation and Daniel are some of the least preached in many churches and some of the most preached in others, depending on their persuasions. <laughs> um, but I hope to, to be an encouragement to you this morning as we look at this. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter, chapter 1, and we'll work our way this morning through Daniel chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, hear now the reading of God's holy word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding, science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among them were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, unto Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and of Azariah, Abednego. Uh, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor the wine while he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces were worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me uh, endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar and the prince of the eunuchs that said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, these ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenances appeared fairer and fatter and flesh than all the children which did in the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had set, had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even under the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And pray with me. Most high God, you are a holy God. You are the one true God. And we recognize, Lord, that if we do not bow the knee to you, uh, we will certainly bow to other false gods. So, Lord, I pray that we would submit ourselves to you and to your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you might make less of me, that I might make much of Christ and his word. Uh, so, Lord, help the preaching of your word to encourage, to exhort, uh, to rebuke. And Lord, help me not to fall short in the way that I handle it. Uh, God, may you be with us as we seek to honor you this morning through your word. Amen. So, Daniel is a fascinating book in the sense that it is uh, what we would consider one of the major prophets, maybe for the term major and minor prophets. Uh, minor prophets meaning simply that they're just shorter. It's not like one's more important than the other. In fact, in the early church, uh, the minor prophets, there's 12 of them, were actually known as the Book of the Twelve. They were usually bound together in one scroll. 
Uh, so if you ever hear the term the book of the 12, it's referring to what we would call the minor prophets in our, uh, in our scripture. What's interesting is the ordering in the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Old Testament, is actually a slightly different orientation. Uh, it actually ends with Second Chronicles rather than Malachi. Uh, so it's, it's put together in a slightly different way, which actually makes some really interesting uh, things for us. One of the things that I'll talk about briefly this morning is that there is a chiastic structure to chapter 1 of Daniel 1. Uh, chiasm is a, a sort of a uh, poetic and literary use of structure that we find in a lot of ancient writings, but particularly in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, chiasm is simply an idea of, of a sort of a, a first and last statement being the same, and the middle statements being the same, and then sort of a key focus point in the middle oftentimes. Uh, the Book of Lamentations, you may not know this, is such a chiasm. In fact, right in the middle is that blessed hope, right? That the one optimistic verse in the entire book is found smack dab in the middle of the chiasm, so to speak. In other words, even though lamentation starts off sad and ends sad, the middle part that's hopeful is the part that is supposed to stick with us. Now, to us, that, that might seem like a weird structure, but we're not uh, ancient Middle Eastern people, so it, it's something that we need to sort of comprehend. Uh, for us, we typically look at, at poetry and sort of couplets and things like that, and that's how our brain focuses. Or we'll, we'll think of maybe Shakespeare, perhaps, and sort of the way that he used prose effectively. Uh, but for the Hebrews, in particular, this chiastic structure is very helpful. And so when we recognize the ordering of God's word, uh, what's actually really fascinating is that there is actually a chiastic structure to the entire Bible, particularly when you take the ordering of the Old Testament as it was originally in Christ's time in the Hebrew Tanakh, uh, and that there's actually some fascinating things. Uh, perhaps you remember the verse from the, from the blood of Abel to the blood of, I actually forget the, the last guy's name, but uh, the last martyr at the end of Second Chronicles, the last one to die who is a godly man, what's the name? You should know it. No? Blood of Abel to the blood of... Thank you. There we go. He's the last one to die at the end of 2 Chronicles. So literally it's the first, first godly martyr at the book of Genesis and the last one of the Chronicles. In other words, Christ is a perfect sacrifice better than anything in the Old Testament, right? So if we, if we order it and think of it sort of in a Hebraic way, it actually makes even more of a powerful thrust. Um, this morning, uh, what's interesting about the book of Daniel that I want to emphasize first is, is that it's broken into sort of two sections. We see a lot of sort of narrative in the first half and a lot of very strange visions and uh, prophecy in the second half. Oftentimes when we look at the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, you'll have little narrative portions kind of sprinkled throughout that kind of tell you what's happening, but it's primarily uh, prophetic declarations. So for this reason, Daniel, while it is called one of the major prophets, is really more of an apocalyptic book, which is more akin to the book of Revelation. Uh, that's actually very important for us to interpret and understand uh, the book of Daniel in the sense that uh, we, you know, I personally confess that the book of Rela uh, Revelation is primarily fulfilled in the, in the year of AD 70. Uh, so I do have a partial preterist interpretation. And the reason why I think that's important is when we look at the 70 weeks and some of the other prophecies that we'll get to at the end of this book, is that we recognize that this book is actually designed to be hopeful. This book is not a book that's supposed to freak us out and make us uncomfortable. Neither is the book of Revelation one of those such books. The book of Revelation is actually oftentimes one of the most favorite books of the, of the churches that are under persecution. Likewise, the book of Daniel. Why? Because we see a couple of key themes throughout the book of Daniel. One, that God is holy. Two, that there's no neutrality in our worship and who we serve. And three, that God is victorious. Right? We see those same themes in the book of Revelation. And so while I'm not going to be in the uh, book of Revelation today, as we go throughout this book, we will see some sort of cross-referencing with the New Testament. Uh, the chapter 1 of Daniel primarily is narrative and speaking, setting the scene for us as to what's happening at this time. It starts off in verse 1 saying, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. This is prophetic fulfillment. We know uh, that around 605, right, uh, 7th century uh, BC, 6th century, right around there, uh, we recognize that uh, this was supposed to happen, um, that there would be a conquering, that the people would be sent, Isaiah prophesied of this, uh, that they'd be sent into captivity. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time this morning because I want to get to the meat of what this chapter is about, talking about the background and the historical relation. What I will commend to you, when Pastor Sean preached this, he preached one whole sermon just on verse 1, uh, last year, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it because he spent the entire time basically commending to us the reason why we must believe the Word of God is infallible and true, right? There is some uh, sort of conflation between, well, it says in the third year of the reign, but elsewhere in the Bible it talks about a slightly different structure 
We confess that Scripture is true. And when we see an apparent discrepancy, our first thought should not be to throw out our faith, but rather to submit to it and find an answer. And there actually is very good answers for any of these supposed discrepancies that we find. Many people likewise question, well, how is it that Jesus rose on the third day, three days, three nights? Well, it wasn't actually three nights, so how do you do that? And then you have to try and talk about Jewish reckoning of time and metaphorical language and, and things like that. There is a valid answer to it. And we must have a faithful response, meaning that our first response when we come against something that might not be easy to understand in Scripture should not be to have unbelief, but rather belief. We know that the Word of God is that tool which, which we see the entire world through. It is our lens. It's our interpretive lens. We don't take the world out here and then apply it to Scripture to help us understand Scripture. That's what the, the Marxist and critical theorists of our day would like us to have. We need to have six other books in our hand to be able to understand the Bible. No, rather, we take the Bible, we believe the Bible, and we seek to understand the Bible and interpret it, the less clear by the more clear, and we seek to let Scripture tell us what it says about itself so that we might rightly look at the world. So as we read this book this morning, we will confess that we believe this is a historical account, that the Bible is full of historical accounts, and that they are true. If we do not believe that Genesis is history, then the gospel is forfeit. If there was not a literal Adam and Eve, then there cannot be a literal second Adam who is our Redeemer via Romans 5 as the second and good substitute for us. So we believe that this is historical, accurate truth. And that's important for us because the gospel is a historical reality. Yes, we confess it in faith. Yes, we can argue it with rhetoric and philosophy and theology. But at the end of the day, we confess that a dead guy came back to life. Why? Because thousands, hundreds of people saw it confessed it, reported it, wrote about it. We believe eyewitness testimony, and not just eyewitness testimony, but the eyewitness testimony as governed through the Holy Spirit and the writing down of scriptures, as Peter tells us, carried about by, uh, by the Spirit. So it's important for us to submit ourselves to the Word of God this morning. Now, it's important for us uh, to remember a couple of key themes when we look at chapter 1. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. But there's two things I really want to drive home this morning. One, that God is holy. And two, that there is no neutrality. No neutrality in anything. And why is it important for us then to remember these realities? John 17, 15, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed, I pray that thou shouldst take them, uh, shouldst take them out of the world, uh, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. In other words, he's not saying take them out of this world. He wants them to, uh, to be united in, in the world. Okay, why is that important? Well, to be holy means to be set apart. But to be set apart doesn't mean to retreat into a sort of a, <laughs> a monastic lifestyle hiding out in a hut somewhere uh, separate from the world. That is not what Christ has called us to. How can we possibly fulfill the Great Commission if we are hiding and separating ourselves? In fact, Christ prayed not that we'd be taken out of the world. Uh, so for those hoping in the rapture, um, I don't think that's what Jesus intended here uh, by any means, but not that we be taken out of the world, but that we should keep, be kept from evil. Right? So our holiness being set apart does not mean that we are geographically distant from those that are committing sin, but rather that we're in the midst of those people committing sin, that we would be kept from evil. So in the same way as we go to engage with those at the festival this afternoon, we'll be in the midst of a dark place. But hopefully we'll be a light, a city on a hill, salt and a preservative to the culture as I preached a few weeks ago, encouraging those that are walking in darkness and that we might be kept from evil. May the Lord sustain us in that. Ephesians 5.1 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Right? So we are not to fellowship with works of darkness, but reprove them. It's also difficult to reprove works of darkness if we're not anywhere around them that are committing them, right? So we are not called to withdraw. That is not what the holiness means or the lack of neutrality means. But rather we are supposed to engage in holiness and holy living, living in the midst, in the midst of uh, sort of these difficult times. So 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 17 says, Behold the days come, that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. We know this came true, right? This was to Hezekiah. He, he had this dream. He, he wanted to, uh, to live a little bit longer. And so he's given this vision. Well, okay, fine. It won't happen to you, but it'll happen to your sons. And he's like, hey, this is good news. Right? No, that's terrible. 
May we not hope that our children's children have to endure terrible things, right? That's foolishness. But nonetheless, Second Kings, we see this prophecy come true here at the beginning of, of Daniel chapter 1. It says, In the third year of the reign, Jehoiakim, the descendant there, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and verses 2, uh, two he carries off all of these treasures from the holy place and carries it off to put in his own God. So he is shunning the temple. He is dis. Uh, disavowing it of its holiness. He's profaning the name of God, carrying away the holy things, right? This is a problem for uh, the people of Israel, clearly. They have been spoiled. God warned them time after time that if they would not turn from their wicked ways, that they would be conquered by their enemies. And this is actually a warning to us in many ways. We look around at the culture around us and we think of ourselves, yes, yes and amen, America is not Israel, right? But the church is. Right? We have been grafted in. We are God's people. And we, wherever we go, are interacting with a holy God. And as such, we can look at society and we see that when we profane God's law, when we hate God's law, when we don't seek to love our neighbor in the way that God has called us to love it, that God does send judgment upon people. Judgment of nations, judgment of individual people, was well, not just an old covenant idea. We still see this happening today. There's a general principle embedded in the moral law that when we do evil one to another, we will reap evil. When we sow it, we will reap it. And we see this in the death and destruction that we have experienced over the past 50 years in particular in our world, right? We, we've ceased from many of the major world wars and we think that we're in a relatively peaceful time. Meanwhile, we are butchering infants in the womb we are chopping off body parts of, of young, healthy individuals, right? We have a, a sick society that thinks they are doing moral good when they're actually profaning God's word. They're rebelling against nature, and they hate him, right? We see judgment. And judgment, Romans 1 tells us, doesn't look like God sending hail fire all the time. It's not always a Sodom and Gomorrah moment where he's raining down sulfur upon us to destroy us, but oftentimes it looks like this, and he gave them over to their lusts. And I believe that is firmly what we are seeing in our society today. That just as many empires that have rose and fallen before us, we see that our nation, while founded on many godly principles and many godly men, is suffering under our own sin. Our own sin. And so I think the book of Daniel is timely for us, and we have a lot to learn from him and from their example that they set, that they would not bow the knee, that they would not... Uh, sort of submit to the king in this way. They sought to obey their master. So the, the second emphasis, and I think a key theme that we need to see here in chapter 1, is the fact that there is no such thing as neutrality. We cannot say we are following God and obeying God, and then go do things that are contrary to God's word. We cannot partially obey. We cannot partially follow. We are either with God or at enmity with him. We're either following and growing closer in sanctification and holiness and godly living, or we're rebelling against him and moving away from him. There isn't a stagnant ground where we stand in which Christ goes, okay, that's neutral ground. That's not how Christ's lordship works. That's not how God's holiness works. God is a holy God who demands that we follow him in holiness. And so it is those sort of themes I want us to look at this morning. Verses 1 through 9, we're going to look at how they are holy in captivity. Verses 10 through 15, how they're holy under their exam and testing. Verses 16 through 20, how they are holy in wisdom. And then the last verse, holy in their preser uh, pres preservation, excuse me, and perseverance as well as purpose. So let us look at this concept of holiness while in captivity. It says that they, uh, verse 4, it says, Look for children. Now it says children, but really this is young men. Most likely they're somewhere in the 16 to 20 range. Young men. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge. And such had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach and learn the tongue of Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. Okay, so a couple things here. We're seeing that they are being taken into captivity in Babylon and being sent to sort of the king's elite boarding school. Think of it this way, right? So this is a training center to turn out good Babylonians, okay? So we're going to see here that there's no neutrality in education, but also it's the king's table, the, the provision that's coming from them. So there's no neutrality even in the food that we eat and the table fellowship that we share. But we also see further on that he changes those na their names. When we call things, I've heard some pastors put it that our culture is in a war for the dictionary. That is true. We need to at, uh, <laughs> engage 
on all of these levels. We need to recognize that names and words matter, that education matters, and that our table fellowship and who we commune with matters. There's no neutrality in any of these areas. And you'll see that this is the key hinge point of their sort of uh, resistance to the tyranny of their occupation. Now, they've been carried off into a foreign land. They've been put into an indoctrination center to make them good Chaldeans, make them good Babylonians, and they are being told what they ought to think. Now, this is not to say that any of the education they receive there is, is all bad, right? Uh, you can learn many good things from a, a, you know, a non-Christian, for example. But the worldview behind it is dis disrupted, contorted, twisted, right? There are many lessons for us to learn here. We also see that their daily provision comes from the king's table. I think this should call to mind the Lord's Prayer, our daily bread that we sing after every sermon, right? This idea of, of provision and daily sustenance. Now that daily sustenance is coming from the hand of this cor the corrupt and evil king rather than the Lord, their God, or their own working in honoring of him. This is why it matters. Likewise, their names. Their names matter. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh or Jehovah has been gracious. Mishael, uh, uh, who is what God is, right? In other words, who is like God? Azariah means Jehovah or Yahweh has helped. Those are great names. Uh, I would commend you, when you name your children, the names that you give your children matter, right? We see this time and time again in Scripture, that when they are given names or given new names, it impacts the way that they live. It impacts the way that they are. You are what you are, and you are what you're called in many ways. So sort of the flippancy of our modern age to have these trendy names, I, I think, is, is interesting. That the cult, it, it sort of reflects the culture that they're a part of, sort of a flippancy to do this. Now, I'm not going to say that you have to always go with a family name or some deep Hebrew or, or Greek meaning name by, by no means. But by all means, please be intentional with names. Names matter. What do they represent? What do they represent? Now, why is this important? Because we see that they sought to change who they were even by what they called them. Right? Bel was the god of the Babylonians. So Belteshazzar meant Bel will protect. Shadrach means inspired of Aku, sort of a moon god. Meshach, belonging to Aku. Abednego, servant of Nego. So these are sun and moon gods within Babylonian lore. Right, so now you will no longer be known by the name of Jehovah. You'll no longer be known by the name of Yahweh. You'll be known by our gods. You will be subject to their rulership in your life, even by the names we call you. And you'll notice in chapter 1, as they resist the Babylonian sort of indoctrination, we still see them called by their Hebrew names. But later on, we'll see that they are called primarily, like how many of you know uh, the three in the furnace and you think of their Hebrew names? No, you think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's because that's what they're called. And so we see a pivot. In fact, there's even a portion of the scripture that it seems Nebuchadnezzar is the one writing, which is interesting, or at least telling and having it written down. So there is a pivot. So one thing I want us to see this morning is that, is that this is not a permanent resistance. It's not that they never receive any of the food or provisions from them, but there is an intentional uh, resistance to this indoctrination. There's an intentional resistance to wanting to say that my God is worthy of my praise and I bow my knee to him alone. Names matter. But likewise, food and fellowship. Why is it important that they resisted the table? Now, I'm going to say just, just briefly that many people, many charlatans seeking to make money, have made up such a thing as like the Daniel diet. Okay, This text is not telling us how we ought to eat. <laughs> it is not telling us what a godly diet looks like. Uh, pulse, if you're wondering, oftentimes is, is translated as vegetable, but really it means like a seed-bearing like a seed or a legume, uh, the, the, the Latin actually translated as legume, right? So I think it's actually worse uh, than just vegetables. It's not like they're just living on zucchini forever, okay? You can add some oil and, and seasoning to zucchini, and that's actually a pretty delicious and sustaining meal, right? We live in Farmville. We know this reality. But I think rather that it's speaking to the chorus, like they're talking beans and seeds and sort of, uh, sort of the, uh, the basic sustenance of life that really is more bird food than human food. Why is this important? 
I think there's a correlation here. I mentioned chiasm and I mentioned uh, sort of correlation earlier. A good correlation here might be made to them walking in the wilderness. In many ways, we see now the righteous Israel is in the wilderness. Daniel and the three are in the wilderness of Babylon and they are being sustained now in much the same way by simply this, these seeds or, or whatever sustenance in much the same way that Israel is sustained by the man in the wilderness. And I think that's important because one of the key themes that we see time and time again is that God serves in such a way and preserves in such a way that he gets all the glory, right? Gideon's forces are reduced down so that they can give God all the glory, not so that they can glory in their own battle and victory, right? Or, or when Moses' arms are being held up, that's what grants the victory, not the actual might of Israel's army. Time and time again, we see that victory belongs to the Lord. One shepherd with a sling striking down the conqueror of the Philistines. In much the same way that Christ has slayed the serpent and crushed his head, so David crushed the head of Goliath. So we see time and again that there is a, a theme of God removing any doubt that he is the one who is actually providing the victory. So the food fellowship, I think, is also something that's important. When we share the table, when we share fellowship with one another, that's not a neutral act. Who do you invite to your table? Who do you invite to your dinner at your home? You invite friends, you invite family, you invite people that you want to get to know and to bless with hospitality, right? We don't dine with our enemies, so to speak. We don't share fellowship with them because to share fellowship with them is to give approval to them in the sense. Now, does that mean that we never invite sinners into our home? By no means, of course we do. We're going to invite people. If, if there are people today that want to join us for a meal, I will gladly receive them, right? What I'm saying, though, is that when you do so, the purpose there is not neutral. When you invite someone into your home, your worldview is on display. Your worship is on display. When you pray before a meal, as archaic as that might seem to some people, there's meaning in that. I've, I've been to people's houses where they sing before they eat. Pastor Sean used to do that all the time. Caught me off guard the first time. He, like, clapped, and then everyone started singing the doxology. I'm like, oh, what's going on? Right? It's like, all right, let's go. I'm amped up to eat now. This is great. <laughs> right? There is an intentionality in who we share table fellowship with. Okay? And then obviously education. They are being sent to be indoctrinated. We are going to give you a new name. We're going to teach you to worship new gods. You're going to eat differently. You're going to sleep differently. You're going to think differently. You're going to be like us. Now, shocker, there might be some correlations to our system today. Maybe. I, don't, I probably don't have to say it out loud. I will. But you're probably thinking in your head all right now, right now, this sounds familiar, right? You're going to come to our school. We're going to teach you to think the way that we thought as we were taught in our universities. We're going to tell you what gender actually is. We're going to tell you that you are evolved from, uh, from I don't know, fish, goo, space dust, you name it, which is absurd. We're going to give you a new name and call you a different gender. And we're going to say that's your identity. And you're going to take it home and you're going to tell your family that's who you are. Does that sound familiar, brothers and sisters? There is no neutrality in education. We must thoroughly equip our people and our children with a Christian worldview. So, again, I'm not going to say exactly what that looks like. I'm not going to be legalistic in what Christian education means. But whether it's homeschool or private Christian education, whatever it may be, we must be willing to sacrifice to make sure that our children are not turned into, as Vodi Bakum says, Roman citizens by sending them to Caesar. Or in our case in the modern day, we don't want to turn our children into, unfortunately, LGBT communists by sending them to the leftist Marxists. Right? That's probably really harsh for a lot of people to hear. There are probably plenty of churches in this valley that would think that that's too hard of a thing to say. But brothers and sisters, we must say it. We must say it. The only reason our madness is where it is today is because we for far too long have been blinding ourselves to this reality. And we've been willing to send our children and then have them come home. I can't tell you how many people have said something to the effect of, I raised my child, I homeschooled my child, and then I sent them to a public university. And they came back completely different. Right? That's frightening. You could do everything that you think you're doing right. You could think your, your child is genuinely saved and then have them rebel in that glorious way. Now, is that going to be always the case? By no means. right? By God's grace, hopefully they are just backsliding and they will come back into repentance. And that we as family members must love them well through it. But brothers and sisters, there is no neutrality in who we eat with. We cannot eat food sacrificed to idols for conscience right? There's no neutrality in what we call ourselves, 
We must redeem the name of Christ in everything. We must redeem the words. Think about the words that have been weaponized against the church. Oh, are you an evangelical? Right? That word is meaningless in our society today because they think of crazy Republicans instead of thinking of God-fearing, Bible-believing people, which is what the word evangelisch means. I went to German for some reason, sorry. <laughs> oh, I meant to go Greek, like euangelion. Good news, those who actually believe the good news of the gospel. I can guarantee you that half the people who call themselves evangelicals in the political system don't even know who God is, right? Okay, that's fine. They can weaponize those terms against us. Let's redeem it. Let's redeem it. The dictionary belongs to God. Same thing when we engage with the cult around here, Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the Mormons of the day, they're everywhere around us. We are at a battle for the dictionary. When they say grace, they don't mean grace. When they say Jesus, they don't mean Jesus. When we say saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, we are the only ones that are actually proclaiming truth. And we must fight for it. We must fight for the battle of the dictionary. So brothers and sisters, Daniel 1 first and foremost tells us that we must be holy, set apart, even in captivity, even in sort of dangerous scenarios and situations. We see this to be true. So Daniel, even though he was given these new names, we notice that they are called by these names until the end of their testing in three years. They would not submit. They would resist. And we'll see the story continued in the next couple of chapters as we look at it. Further on, though, starting in verse 10 through 15 now, we see this actually being tested. And again, God is given the uh, authority here. Verse 10 says, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord. Uh, the king, who hath appointed you meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces uh, liking the children which are uh, of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. In other words, he knows he has a master he serves too. He's like, wait, wait, wait. If you do this, then you guys are going to look kind of sickly and pale. Okay? People that are like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat nothing but seeds and go live in the wilderness. And it's probably trending on TikTok somewhere right now as we speak. Um, foolish, right? It's actually not very sustaining. That's kind of the whole point. So again, the whole fad Daniel diet thing is silly because it's actually the opposite of the point. The whole point is this shouldn't be able to sustain you, and yet God sustained them anyway. He's like, wait a second, you guys are going to be sickly, and then I'm going to get in trouble. My head's going to be endangered, right? So what is Daniel's answer? Well, test us. We'll put God to the test. Go ahead. I believe God will sustain me. Give us a chance here. Verse 11 says, then, then Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech you, these ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. It's also a, a quick side note here. A lot of people will look at this passage and be like, see, this is why we don't drink wine, which is, again, very silly, because there are so many texts all throughout the Old Testament where God actually uh, commends them for, for enjoying wine, right? Jesus turns water into wine, uh, I mean, even the way the, the whole sacrificial system was made up is that you could actually go into town, exchange something for money, and you could use it to buy strong drink to worship God. Like, so again, we don't want to be uh, purists in the sense of adding to God's word. Now, we are not to get drunk. We are not to abuse the good gifts that God has given us. But the prohibition here is not that Daniel should abstain from these things forever. The prohibition here is that Daniel is saying, I will not submit now in this time of schooling, because I will not say that I am yours or that I belong to Bel, but rather I belong to Yahweh, to Jehovah. So what's important here is that, that God grants the results. Like I mentioned Gideon earlier and others. I would also mention Joseph, right? It says that he found favor with this, uh, this sort of instructor who's really probably more like a jailer to them, in much the same way that Joseph found favor uh, with his jailer and also with the servants of the house. In other words, God will prosper people even in the midst of the deepest trial. If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Uh, Calvin, who struggled mightily, had many terrible things happen. He married later on, sort of begrudgingly, finally was married, had a child, lost a child, lost his wife. Great, deep grieving. Very dark times. And one of the things he said is that he who wants to be used mightily of God must suffer mightily at the hands of God. Suffer mightily for God that he might be used mightily by God. We recognize that when we are faced with trials in this life, that God is the one who sustains us. And when he sustains us, it is for our joy and for our hope. It might not feel like it in the moment. It might not feel like it when we are struggling, when we are s sort of under the burden and heavy weight of loss or sorrow or pain or sickness or lack of 
physical goods and things that we need. But nevertheless, God grants the results regardless of that foundation. We recognize that we could have literally nothing and still have more joy than the richest people. Why is it that the suicide rates are so high amongst the rich celebrities of our day? Because they could have the world, so to speak. And if they have not Christ, they have nothing. They have nothing. They are without hope. So they are kept apart and holy even while being tested. They find favor with them. It says, verse 13, Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children and eat the portion of the king's meat. So compare us. Compare us to them. Verse 14, So he consented to them in this matter and proved them for ten days, tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So they're eating nothing but like seeds and beans. And somehow they look healthier, stronger, you know, than those who are enjoying the, the red, red steaks, <laughs> so to speak, of the day. They are kept apart and vindicated and made holy in their faithfulness. Verses 16 through 20 now shows how God blesses them in wisdom and understanding throughout these three years. Verse 16 says, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. We'll see many of those in the times to come. In fact, he's going to interpret uh, not only the, the dream about the statue, but the dream about the tree. And for those of you visiting, when we get to Daniel 2, that's actually the fun thing. The reason we're called Stone Mountain Church is from Daniel chapter 2, right? The, the rock that was uh, cut without hands grows to be a big mountain that covers the entire earth, right? We recognize that we are members of Christ. He is the cornerstone. We are being knit together as his church. And by God's grace, the church of Christ will be a stone mountain, a stalwart bulwark that will not move, that the entire earth will be able to look to and say, there is Christ and his truth. And that's why we're called what we're called. But it says in verse 16, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So he said, okay, you did fine for 10 days. Let's go ahead and see how it goes. And he sustains them thus for three years. So as for these four children, these four youths, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the day, so after the three years, the king said he should bring them in. And the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. Again, here's this table fellowship. So they're, they've, they've been abstaining from the table of the king, in a sense, and now they are now communing with him. And among them all was found, found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better. Uh, I'd like to know what that math equation is. Like, did he, like, ask questions? Is it literally like a ten-to-one ratio? So it's I think it's interesting that it's 10 times specifically, but 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Note that it says all his realm. So they've been tested for three years. They're young youths. They probably came in when they're 16, 17, 18. Now they're 20, 21, maybe 22 at the oldest, maybe. They're, they're sort of exiting the school and they're being tested. And they're seen to be wise and have understanding not just better than their classmates. This isn't like they entered, you know, Southern Seminary and then graduated, you know, summa cum laude. They're better than all their classmates. No, that'd be like going to Southern Seminary, coming out and putting R.C. Sproul to shame. Okay, I know he's a Presbyterian. I made a Baptist seminary reference, but you get the point, right? That would be like coming out of, of a, a school and being able to actually be wiser than, and not just wiser in a little bit, but 10 times wiser than all of the, the veterans, so to speak. That's a crazy thought. Now, I know that uh, through years of education, and serve, there's so much more that I want to learn and grow in. And so when I see young seminarians and young people who are aspiring to the pastorate, it gives me great hope that they continue to learn. Lifelong learning and education is something that we need to be known for in the church. This is one of the reasons why we continue to read books monthly, uh, you know, as the men of the church or, and as the officers of the church, we read books together frequently, constantly. We are always growing, challenging, learning. Many of you I know are ad, you know, advocates for various podcasts, right? Those are great educational tools that God has given us in the modern age. We can hop on YouTube or Spotify and listen to sermon after sermon from great pastors and theologians, not only that are living today, but that have perished in the past hundred years. We have access to those who died before us in the writings of the Puritans and the Reformers and the Church Fathers. 
We have tool after tool that no Christians have ever had before. We can constantly be growing in knowledge. And yet we see these three go through their school and they come out wiser than all who are in the entire realm. And Babylon was not a small place. Their kingdom was pretty vast. Right, as we'll see in chapter 2, a great kingdom of a gold, in a sense. It's great glory. Even though it wasn't as big as some of the kingdoms that came, it was more glorious, more worthy in some ways. And so we see that they are um, exceeding. Exceeding. Again, we just finished the book of Colossians. What was one of the key themes in the book of Colossians? The wisdom of Christ. The supremacy of Christ in all things. When we have God's word, God's knowledge, God's wisdom, we have a supremacy of understanding, even if we are infantile in our understanding of it. We have access to an infinite wealth of wisdom in Christ. He is abounding in an abundance of good truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. So when we walk in Christ, when we follow Christ, we have wisdom. And so we see this on display with the three and with Daniel. We must seek to be holy in our wisdom. And so what then is the source? I already just said it, right? If we want to be holy in our wisdom, if we want to be set apart in the way, again, this must be the interpretive lens by which we think through all things. Anything that we learn. The Bible is not a scientific textbook. I get that. That's fine. It doesn't tell us how to put together a smartphone. like Right? But you know what it does do? It gives us the necessary preconditions for the scientific method to even work. It gives us the worldview in which truth is sustainable. It gives us the worldview in which we can actually test things, repeat things, count on a stagnant and static universe that is constant. We can recognize that the future will look like the past. We can recognize that we can anticipate that the sun will rise tomorrow. The gravity will not fail. Why? Because Christ Jesus, Colossians 1 and 2, sustains all things holds all things together by the power of his being. And if God sustains all things, then science actually works. If everything was just random happenstance, we would have no hope that the future will not just turn in and devolve into chaos at any moment. But rather, we believe that Christ sustains all things. Then finally, in verse 21, they are holy and set apart in the way that they are preserved for their purpose. So says, Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Why is this important? Again, that chiastic structure I mentioned earlier. We see that there are 70 years of captivity from the third year of the reign of, of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Starts with the king, ends with the king. Daniel, uh, Daniel 1.21 tells us the king Cyrus. So 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21 says, And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where there were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Okay, this is Jeremiah, right? Uh, uh, prophesying in Chronicles. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Now, for those of you that remember the Gettysburg Address, a score is 20 years, right? So three score is 60 and 10 years. That'd be 70 years. So now we see the length of the captivity from the uh, end of the reign of Jehoiakim to the first year of King Cyrus, who is the one who decreed to let them return back. So Ezra, Nehemiah, those books. Uh, we see now a 70-year period. So in this we see sort of a chiasm. Verse 1 talks about the king who is ruling and reigning when, uh, when they are led into captivity. In verse 21, we see the first year of the king who will actually ultimately release them from captivity. And throughout the middle, and if anyone's interested, I can actually send, uh, send you this structure. This is actually something that, uh, uh, that Sean wrote up when he was, was going through this that I thought was very helpful, uh, but I didn't necessarily want to delve into super deeply today. Uh, but we see sort of a, a first and last thing. So we, we see their former education. It says that they were very wise, verses 2 through 7. And then at the end, it says that they are wiser than all of them, right? So king, wisdom. King, wisdom, right? We see that. And in the middle of it, we see the testing, right? So ultimately, a chiastic structure is this. It shows that there was a king that was over them, that there was wisdom, that they were tested, then they were tested, then there was wisdom, then there was a king. That's a chiasm, okay? God is intentional. And what is he trying to emphasize right in the middle? 
that God is the one who gives us the victory in every test and trial in life. That all of our wisdom, all of the lordship that we su submit to in this life, those things are minimal in comparison to the fact that God is the one who sustains us in all things. So a few applications for us this morning. First and foremost, we have victory in Christ. We are set apart in Christ. There is no neutrality. We must submit to him as our king. As we sang earlier from Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9 says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, to which I asked, did Christ forget to ask? Did Christ, when he sat down upon that cross and died and then went into the grave and then rose again unto newness of life, when he ascended into heaven to his father, did he forget to ask for the inheritance that was promised to him? I think not, brothers and sisters. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Brothers and sisters, there is no neutrality. God will always win when pitted against opposition. He is the greater God. Baal is busy relieving himself. God is on his throne. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Christ has asked for the inheritance of the nations. We sit here in southern Idaho because Jesus has ruled and conquered and is conquering through his loving gospel message. Because he proclaimed the goodness of the good news of his atoning work to his people. We now sit in southern Idaho of all places on the complete opposite side of the globe because those 12 went out and preached the gospel and were willing to endure fire and flame and lions and swords for us. For us. Jesus is still ruling. Jesus is still reigning. It is tempting, I know, to despair. It is tempting to want to hide. It is tempting to want to withdraw. But we must advance. I'd like to see a, a, a new... Uh, <laughs> I heard it from like Rachel, Rachel Jankovic originally, but she, she's like, let's quit doing ladies retreats. Let's do ladies advances. I thought that was a good observation. That's actually a good thing for us to do. You know what? Let's quit going on retreats. Let's start going on advances. Let's go equip ourselves. Yes, we can withdraw for a minute to recuperate, get some energy, but that should be intentional to equip us to then go forth and proclaim the goodness of the gospel. May we quit sitting on our heels as the church. It doesn't say that the, the gates of the church, <laughs> no, it says the gates of hell shall not prevail. That means that we're the ones advancing. That means that we're the ones proclaiming the gospel against the enemy of darkness. Jesus' name shall be honored in all the earth, and we are to be faithful. So today I challenge us to be faithful, whether we're in Babylon, and there's many places that are much more like Babylon than Idaho. I'll tell you that. As frustrating as some of the things may be in our, our state, there's a lot more light going on here than there are in many places in this world. So be thankful. But also, don't sit back and watch culture deteriorate. Don't sit back and refuse to love your neighbor enough to speak the truth into their life. Be willing to stand up like Daniel and these others did and say, I will not eat and I promise you that I'll be okay. And I'm going to show you that my God is good. As we'll see later on in the book, that we can say that even if, even if the Lord does not preserve me, I will not bow the knee. That must be our attitude. Believing firmly that he will preserve us if he so desires. So whether in death or in life, a great question in the Heidelberg Catechism, what is our one hope in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong both body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that no hair on my head will be harmed without his hand causing it to be so. So we can have true faith and assurance. Brothers and sisters, there is no neutrality. There's no neutrality in the home. Name your children wisely. Educate them wisely. You cannot send your children to be indoctrinated 30 hours a week and hope that a one-hour family worship in the evening will somehow undo it. I'm sorry. You can't. Please be faithful. You must be faithful, knowing that there's no neutrality in our table fellowship. Make sure that who you are breaking bread with are people that you can encourage and approach with the truth, that you don't hide your faith from them, that when people come to your table, that you are not pretending not to be Christian for a few minutes to make them more comfortable. When you go to your workplace, you have to be Christian there too. How much compromise are you willing to, to participate in to advance in your career? Hopefully zero, right? Repent. 
Do not compromise. Here at the church, likewise, our name matters. The way we educate in the Bible matters. The way we fellowship at the table matters. Our confession matters. As we read earlier in Isaiah 7, he said, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am. Send me. We are being sanctified as God's people. So may we be equipped thoroughly each week to proclaim the authority and rulership of Christ. There is no neutrality here at our church. And then may we be equipped to submit ourselves, to be made clean before a holy God and sent out for his mission. And this is the one that makes most people uncomfortable. There's no neutrality in the government either, brothers and sisters. If there's no God over the state, the state becomes its own God. Acts 5 that we read earlier, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given them to obey them. Brothers and sisters, we must be witnesses even to our civil magistrates. We must be willing to proclaim the goodness of the gospel. We are not going to win the nation by the sword. There is no rebellion. There is no administration of the law by force. We're not the, you know, the, the rebellion in Münster. I've been to that cathedral in Germany where the cages are hung, where they hung the Anabaptists who rebelled against them, waiting for the birds to eat them, or they would put them in the river and wait, wait for the water to rise to drown them. Right? We're not going to take anything by a physical sword. But God has given us a much mightier sword to bear to the world, to proclaim the goodness that the law of God might restrain evil, prick the conscience, and give us an open door to proclaim the forgiveness of Christ. So may we proclaim the Lordship. There is no neutrality in any sphere. There is not one square inch of this atmosphere, of this world, of this cosmos, as Abraham Kuyper said, that Christ does not look at and declare mine. So we must proclaim the Lordship of Christ everywhere and anywhere and know that Christ has saved us. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, but by God's grace at the right time, he died for us, the ungodly, that we might have newness of life. So walk in him, brothers and sisters. Walk in him, exercising your God-given responsibility and rights to be his children and to live like it, even in the midst of captivity, even in the midst of Babylonian philosophy, even in the midst of great evil. May we be a light, a light to those who are in darkness. Show them the goodness of God in the way that you act, in the way that you speak, and give them the good news that Jesus Christ died for such as those. But for the grace of God, go I. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good, that you are holy, that you are just, that you are true, that you are working all things together according to your purposes. I pray, Lord, that we would find our hope in you and in you alone. God, help us to stand against the darkness of our time, to be willing to find our sustenance in you alone, to be willing to go without that we might not taint ourselves with the evil ways. Lord, it would be better for us to have a lower-paying job than to compromise and to lie and to be deceitful to get those promotions or to get along with the boss. Lord, it would be better for us to have... uh, (laughs) So, so fewer possessions than to advance ourselves through evil ways. Lord, I pray that people might look at us and see that we are humble and meek, yes, but also bold in our proclaiming that you are Lord and that you are God. So Lord, help us to point always to you and to your word as our light and as our beacon of hope. Help us to be holy and set apart. Help us to have no neutrality in the way that we live our lives. May we be thoroughly Christian everywhere that we go. And Lord, I pray that you would preserve us, sustain us, strengthen us, that our countenance might be uh, good before those who would examine us. And Lord, that we would not be met with uh, reviling words in our, our mouths, but rather that we would bless our enemies, that we would love those who persecute us, and that we would show grace to those who would offend us. God, you are worthy of our praise. May we continue to worship you in spirit and truth this morning, we pray. Amen.